Marhaba, keep calm. With international travel resuming as normal um, and all of the restrictions and things kind of being lifted everywhere, I thought it's time for a new video about traveling to Jordan. <laughs> Jordan is a beautiful, diverse, exciting country to visit with the most wonderful people. And I wanna help you guys, inshallah, to have the best trip that you can. This might turn into a bit of a lengthy video, so I've separated everything into chapters. First, we're gonna start off with when to visit. Then we're gonna discuss communications, we're gonna discuss travel around the country, whether or not you need to speak Arabic, and finally, social etiquette and norms and what to wear and those kind of questions that people ask me all the time. Before I get started, just a quick plug to say that my Yalla Neki classes that my sister-in-law teaches, registration will be open again soon for those. So there's all of the information in the description box below. And you can visit this website here as well. And you can find out all the information about the spoken Jordanian Arabic classes that we give online. It's a really good way of preparing for your trip, by the way, just FYI. So when to visit? A lot of people prefer not to visit Jordan during Ramadan, which is really soon approaching. It starts on April 2nd, inshallah, and will end on May 2nd. But the, the dates can vary slightly. So generally people don't want to come during Ramadan because it's going to be a lot slower. Um, you don't get to kind of, the, the certain things will be closed or things will open at different hours. Sometimes it can be a bit confusing to travel during this time. Other people really like to visit Jordan during this time because it's a bit of a, it's, it's a different pace. It's a different kind of experience. I would say there's nothing really wrong with coming during Ramadan, but you have to just keep it in mind that people are fasting. Things are slower. You can't expect um, everything to work in the same kind of efficient way that it normally would. Um, and you just have to prepare a little bit more. And I'm often asked how Christian tourists get along during Ramadan in Jordan. You're fine, like it's no different to any other time. <laughs> We've got Christians who live in the country, Aslan, like it's, it's fine. So although the pace will be a little bit slower and you'll be, need to be a little bit more organized, you'll also get to experience the nighttime feasts after um, everyone has finished fasting and um, all the lights and the beautifulness that comes with Ramadan in the evenings. As well, you're going to enjoy quieter tourist spots too, because there's, there's less people and, 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 you know, less people in the streets during the daytime and things. And it's a really nice way of exploring the city um, in that man, obviously, exploring the other cities as well um, and the tourist hotspots too. One thing to note about the tourist hotspots is that places like the Dead Sea, the hotels there, do actually fill up quite a lot during Ramadan because people who aren't fasting tend to go there. Spring in Jordan, which is happening right now, is absolutely beautiful. Um, and it's probably a little bit too late to be telling you this if you're not planning on jumping on an airplane tomorrow. But the window for spring is really, really short in Jordan. But it is, I think, it's one of those magical, the, the most magical season, like nowhere else. You'd like, how do I say this? Springtime in Jordan is like no other springtime. In my opinion, you've got really um, gentle breezes, you've got sunshine, you've got some showers, everything goes so green as well. It's a beautiful time to visit. You can expect temperatures to start creeping up around May and then they reach their peak in July, August time when we can have some really, really hot weather. Summer is fantastic if you're looking for those like real desert kind of vibes. So everything goes beige and it gets very dry and very hot. Um, and very dusty as well. And I, I would suggest, I mean, you, you know how hot it's gonna get in the deserts and things or around Petra or the Dead Sea area. I would recommend that you avoid the midday sun as much as possible um, and plan your trips so you do things early in the mornings and then later in the afternoons and avoid peak sun time because it's hot. <laughs> Autumn, which starts in like late September, October, can be very unpredictable weather. Um, it can get very windy and things. Winter here is, like I said, it's really lovely. There's only like a short period of time when we get really, really cold weather, which is usually January, February time. Um, but you know, it's March now and it's snowing. So who knows, <laughs> that's not normal, normal weather. But the one thing that you should keep in mind if you are planning a, a trip to Jordan in the later months, in the autumn or winter months from October onwards, is that the wadis, the valleys and places, if you wanted to go hiking and do anything like that in the Dead Sea area or anything like that, those areas are prone to flooding. So if it is a wet season, 
then you're going to be, you're not gonna be able to do those kinds of activities. The next thing on my list is communications. For me, a nervous traveler, when I'm going to a country where I don't speak the language, I really want to have internet connection so that I can use Google Translate, so that I can look things up quickly if I'm in a pinch, so that I can um, use public transport or, or order a taxi, things like that. So getting a SIM card would be really like high up there on my priorities. So you can purchase a SIM card when you arrive at the airport, but I recently discovered something called eSIMs. It's not available for every single phone, um, but there is a, uh, an electronic SIM that you can purchase before you travel to the country or while you're in the country, and that will use, it will kind of like piggyback off your SIM card and it will give you data. Number three is about transport. So Jordan doesn't have a very strong public transport system and people tend to get around using yellow taxis or personal cars or there are bus systems, but if you don't speak the language, um, it, it can be a little bit complicated. But if you're traveling between cities and things, there are buses, of course, that go on a regular basis. Tourists tend to use jet buses when they're traveling between cities. Renting a car might be the best option for you because there are long distances between certain tourist points. Like the distance between Petra and the Dead Sea is around 200 kilometers. But what people often do is they will hire a local driver to drive them to their spots. And um, I think that often people kind of become quite good friends with their drivers as well. So it's, it's, it's kind of a little bit like having a personal tour guide as well, like they tend to be really helpful. So you can book a driver either privately by contacting them on Facebook, um, always in the in the Facebook groups and things, you'll find people advertising um, that they're driving, their drivers. Um, and you can also book through an agency or through um, in, in a package deal. For getting around inside the cities, you use yellow taxi cabs. These you hail from the side of the road, you don't book them first and they run on a meter or you use Uber, which you do obviously book first, and that's, you know, you know what Uber is. Um, we also have a Jordanian version, which is Kareem, and their prices are slightly cheaper, and basically every Uber driver, and every taxi driver uses like Uber and Kareem apps. So yeah, it's all the same. The thing with using a yellow taxi cab is that they're not necessarily going to know where you wanna go to. So you need to give them um, a general location, you'll tell them a general area, or a landmark that's nearby and then you will direct them like street by street to get to where you need to go and that can be really complicated if you don't have the language so that's why we're saying getting on the internet is really good so that if you have an uber you can just pin it a tip for taking the yellow taxis is that you want the taxi driver to turn their meter on and the meter is located in the front of the taxi like it will be usually it will either be up on the dashboard or it will be wedged between the handbrake and the passenger seat so that you can see it from the back which is where if you are a woman, you'll get in at the back. If you're a man, you will get in at the front, but you should be able to see the, the meter wherever you are. And it will start on a certain number. It's, it's a very low number that all the, all the meters start with. And then as you move, it will start ticking up. But if the taxi driver tells you that it's broken or that it's not working or you don't need to use it or that he'll give you a better price, just leave the taxi and get another taxi is fine because it's not broken, trust me. You have yellow taxis for each city, so they're not supposed to operate in other cities. So a lot of the time a taxi driver will tell you that he can't take you to another city. Number four is, do you need to speak Arabic? No, you don't need to speak Arabic, although it's really nice if you do try and learn some words, people really appreciate it um, and it will make your life easier as well. Um, join our course. <laughs> So most Jordanians, they do speak English to a certain level or they have a good understanding of English, but maybe they don't speak it. When it comes to touristy things like hotels, um, tourist locations and things, people will be, will be speaking English. Um, you'll find that the, the, the guys who are like working at the really touristy places like Petra and Jarash and things, they'll be able to speak English in every accent that you can imagine. And they can speak like six or seven languages, like mashallah, they're really cool. Number five is dietary issues. If you have an allergy or you have a dietary requirement or anything like that, you have to be quite vigilant and quite assertive with letting people know about that and with checking what's in your food. Food preferences such as vegetarianism or veganism can be overlooked um, and you may be served chicken as an alternative to meat when you say that you're a vegetarian which I know sounds a, bit, uh, sounds a bit confusing, but that is something that often happens. 
Um, so if you have something like that, or if, especially if you have something a bit more serious, if you have lactose intolerance or something like that, you need to just be a little bit more vigilant than you normally would be with making sure that the person understands you and that you need to know exactly what is in the food. So social etiquette issues. Something to keep in mind with social etiquette here in Jordan is that some of the things that can feel quite sexist are actually are actually thought of as a respectful thing here in Jordan. So things like addressing the male in a group uh, and not the women, or uh, serving women first in a, in, a, in a queue if it's night time or if there's, the place is packed with men, or um, a man not making eye contact with you or not being very smiley with you. It really depends on the situation and the context and the people that are involved, but just it's something useful to keep in mind that whilst these things can make women bristle a little bit sometimes, um, it's, it's meant with the best, with the best um, intentions, in my opinion. I am asked all the time about what women should wear. I have addressed this in a video before, but I will mention it again now. If you're in a really touristy place, then it doesn't matter. If you're in a hotel or if you're at like the peak tourist places, then you see women wearing anything they feel like and no one really bats an eyelid. Um, but, you know, I feel like to have the most comfortable and the most enjoyable time, then maybe try wearing things that are a little bit more modest than you normally would and try and mirror somewhat what you see other women wearing here. But I would just say like as a general hard and fast rule, cleavage, thighs, stomach, and upper arms like tend to be the areas that people cover up most and inshallah if i do a part two for this video it will be about the prices of things how much you should expect to pay from anything from a bottle of water to shawarma to hotel prices um inshallah i will get that done soon so that's today's video i hope that it is useful for you and if you are booking or planning a trip to Jordan. I hope that you have a wonderful time and please any message any questions that you might have you can feel free to message me. Take care. Masadame.